So, you know, I, uh, I, I feel very connected to the military here. Growing up next to Fort Knox, you, you can't be here without having some kind of uh, sentimental attachment to it for sure. They got a little bit of gold here too, right? Yeah, a little bit of gold. Little I heard something. I'm not sure where. <laughs> I think it's inside that bottle right I, I there. I think so. I agree. I agree. down the bourbon road with your host jim and mike so grab a glass of your favorite bourbon and kick back we would like to thank tommy and gwen mitchell from logheads home center for supporting this episode of the bourbon road find out more about their fine rustic furniture at logheadshomecenter.com Well, this week, Mike and I were fortunate enough to be invited over to the Boundary Oak Distillery uh, in Radcliffe, Kentucky, uh, sit down with Brent Gooden, the master distiller there, and talk about some of the things they have going on and some of the history of, uh, of the distillery itself and, you know, where, where Brent comes from and his family and a little bit of history about their family's uh, ties to Kentucky. Uh, we had a really good time with him, very generous guy full of knowledge, knows an awful lot about the bourbon world, and uh, has had some pretty big accomplishments in the seven or so years he's been he's been doing this. So I think y'all are going to really enjoy this episode. But before we switch over uh, to the actual interview itself, I'd like to tell everybody we've got a new Facebook group now tied to the Bourbon Road. It's uh, called the Bourbon Roadies. You can either go to uh, the Bourbon Road Facebook page and You'll see that group mentioned there. You can simply search on Facebook for the Bourbon Roadies. In order to join, just a few simple questions, nothing you won't know the answer to. And we'll invite you in, and that's where we'll chat and talk about the show and interact with our listeners. And if you've got questions for us or or we want to make some announcements, that'd be the place to do it. So we look forward to it. And uh, here's the show. Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Shannon. And I'm Mike Hyatt. And we are the Bourbon Road. And today we are in Radcliffe, Kentucky. Down here at Boundary Oak Distillery. Brent, great to have you with us. Glad to be here. Like I always say, we don't waste a whole lot of time chit-chatting in the beginning. Are you going to let us get in that pour? Let's get right into it. We like to get straight to the whiskey. Absolutely. You guys don't mess around. Yeah. So what'd you bring for us today, Brent? Uh, I brought some of our cast strength uh, single barrel Abraham Lincoln. Uh, we are in love with cast strength alcohols here at Boundary Oak. And uh, we, you know, when you have the 16th president and probably one of the five most famous humans on the planet, you better put your best stuff or which you can get the best stuff in, in the bottle. So I think we've, we've done really well with, with Link. <laughs> yeah, it's a fine looking bottle. Now, was this your, was this your flagship product? Was this the product you started on? Uh, this was one of them. This is obviously uh, the most high profile other than, of course, our George S. Patton. Patton was pretty super high profile also. Uh, but Patton wasn't a bourbon. Patton was kind of his own concoction, his own product. So, But as far as uh, bourbons, Lincoln was our first big bourbon. And you've already poured us a little bit. Here. I sure have. I knew you guys were coming. So, All right. Cheers. Cheers. You know, with... Uh, with cast strength alcohols, if you pour them and you allow them to set for a little bit, um, uh, and, or if you don't do that, you're really missing out on the essence of, of good bourbons. Uh, the smell of the uh, that you don't get out of, of anything that's been cut out, I mean, that's lower proof. Cast just gives you the, the real intense flavors, uh, especially even just in the smell before you drank it, that you can't get in any other whiskeys or any other bourbons. And so uh, I th- I think that's why uh, um, there's these some of the best whiskeys coming out of Kentucky and the United States. I think you hit a home run with this. Well, thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so, so the the nose on this is has got a little bit of a floral attribute to it. It a does floral fruity. It does, and when you add water. Uh, to cast strength when you add water to bourbon uh, you know you bring forward a lot of the ethanols and I think you also kind of dilute a lot of those flavors those very delicate flavors that it's had time for years for it to kind of acclimate together okay and we're, we're actually in a room here with uh, with a little bit of airflow and we're we don't have Glen Cairns today so mm. it makes the nosing a little bit a little bit tougher but yeah. I can still pick it up 
Mike, what do you think? Oh, I think I can taste a little bit of that cherry, that cherry that old Abe chopped down back in the day. <laughs> was that was that Abe that chopped down the cherry? I think I think that was George Washington, but oh, it's okay. I, I, you know what? He I, was the rail splitter. Well, he's on the show next week. So. <laughs> <laughs> rail splitter. Rail splitter. That's right. Well, I, can, I can definitely taste some of that oak in there. You then. sure can. And uh, and when that barrel again, when that barrel's had time to kind of set and acclimate, it it just it, it gives you uh, we, you know it's pre prohibition style bourbon, and you know an old forester has done a wonderful wonderful job at it, and and we were so jealous of of what they did, and 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 I knew that when I did Lincoln, I wanted to to, to try to do something very similar to those pre prohibition style alcohols. Now. Give us the specifics on this. This is a high rye bourbon. Yeah, it's in twenty percent, twenty two percent right now. It's very when we call it the very uh, vanilla of, of bourbons. It's right in that center spot. There's a lot of twenty percent whiskeys out there, twenty percent ryes, um, and uh, it, we just feel it, it's of all the whiskeys, it's probably at, at the, the peak of the most popular when it comes to 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 you know mash bills. Yeah, I'm getting your cherry on the taste there, too. And a little, little bit, bit of cinnamon. A little bit of cinnamon, a little pepper on the back there. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. You know, um, you know, Abraham Lincoln, uh, obviously, you know, during his presidency, there was a very big time in America where people were very much against alcohol. And, uh, you know, Lincoln was the only president in American history that we know of that actually had a bar license. So when he was in New Salem, uh, Illinois, he he did run a, a grocery store which had his license with his name on it. So we, we think that's pretty neat. That's pretty cool. Now, <laughs> is there any evidence that Lincoln drank the liquor? If or? he did, you know, I, I don't think anyone spoke of it. You know, it was hard to be anybody from Kentucky that didn't sip it once or twice in his lifetime. But, yeah. uh, you know, in uh you know, obviously there's no documentation of that. And I think that would have been the time he was alive. That would have been very much hush hush if he had. Now he's pretty famous for uh, buying some whiskey, though, and some bourbon for his uh, his famous general. Right. I, that's well, I, I know that uh, d- during the war, there's a lot of good quotes about him and some of his command staff. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think the story went. He wanted to find out what U.S. Grant drank. Mm-hmm. And uh, so he found out and he said, I'm going to ship a barrel to that of that to every general out there so they can fight as good as u.s grant yes absolutely so you've got some deep deep ties in kentucky right yeah can you can you tell us a little bit about your family's heritage here sure you know i i said uh we, we all couldn't swim so that's why we stayed we couldn't get across the ohio so <laughs> when we, uh we, you know we we migrated to america in probably the the mid 1700s and um found our way up to kentucky i think a lot of it was quaker influence and um, settled in, you know, in Nelson County and actually started one of the, the, the frontier forts there along the Roland Fork River that held, you know, quite a few of the families, the Severns family and uh, some of the Cradies. Some of my still are my neighbors today um, that uh, were some of the very first families to Hardin County on the way. And actually, the, the fort was in Nelson County. So that was in about 1780. So that was Samuel Gooden. That's who my middle son is named after. And so... Um, We've been in Kentucky. Kentucky's all we know in America. That's for sure. Oh, that's that's Bargetown now, right? That's Bargetown. That's Nelson County, correct? That's the. Uh, so, what did they call that that area back in the day? Uh, you know, it's new. It's around New Haven now. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if it was. It was the frontier for sure. Okay. You know, um, as they were pushing out past uh, Bargetown, it was it was un, um, you know, un, uncharted area, and I think a lot of them were looking for free land grants, were looking for places to settle down. Those opportunities that weren't weren't in Europe. Um, and, uh, I, I think that they thought that this was the place to be. You could come here, you could distill and, you know, obviously whiskey had more value than money did. And especially if you were training with the native Americans, you know, whiskey had value even to them. Right. Now I know if you, if you fought in the revolutionary war that at the end of your service, at the end of the war, Mm -hmm. you're, you, you, as a, as a soldier who fought in that war, you had the opportunity to take either $300 or Western lands. Right. And some took the money. That's right. And some took Western lands. And those Western lands were the Virginia territory, which in fact was Kentucky, right? That's correct. We okay. were Virginia at that particular time. Yeah. Now, Brent, how did you, uh, how'd you come up with the idea? I said, I'm sure you didn't start out as a young man. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to open up myself a distillery here in, in the heart of Kentucky. How'd you, how'd you come up with that idea? Somebody in your family say, Hey, we need to, we need to bring this back into the family. 
Well, you know, I wish I'd have had, you know, I think the story's pretty cool, but, uh, you know, people ask me, if, you know, everyone always assumes that you do something illegal before you get started. And and I kind of wish that we'd had, that gives me a little more flavor, but we were always very, very honest about it when we started. We, we never distilled anything until we got a license, but it, the actual, the beginning of it started with my then 12 year old son, Thomas, who uh, was just enamored with the idea of Kentucky's history and, and whiskey production and alcohol production production. He, and he just was just insistent that we would look at this opportunity to manufacture something. And, and, and I told him, you know, son, it's illegal. We can't do that. It's probably, you know, but he was just so insistent. Uh, and I think the nucleus of it came from a, a tree that's on our farm that our distillery is named after. And uh, the water at the base of that tree just gushes up. And so we collect all that water to distill with. And so he knew then um, that that water was very important from my my grandmother, his great grandmother. And uh, so he felt like that we'd had the, you know, uh, a, a, a seam of gold in that water and we should take advantage of it. So I said, I'll tell you what we'll do. Uh, we will start to see how far we can go in this process and get a license. And uh, and we started and we just never stopped. So, wow. What a great story. Yeah. So this tree, it, does it have significance related to Lincoln? It does not. It's just uh, when uh, this is a boundary tree that is on the farm where we originally started the distillery in this county. And uh, it, of course, the boundary trees are the ones that they don't cut because they're the ones with the pins in them that the surveyors leave. So this was our boundary tree that on the farm, um, the roots were so large that they broke down through the soft limestone up on these knobs. And uh, the water just gushes out through the top of it. And and it has been since my dad's owned the farm since the 50s. Um, and um, it's just a great source for uh, a water and is a great source for the water that we use here. And uh, so the, the tree... Uh, got significance because it was uh, just the place where we use, I mean, all the water from all, everything we distill comes from there. So, uh, and I knew of a boundary oak tree because of Lincoln's boundary oak tree. Now, now a lot of people don't know what knobs are. Why do they call this area the knobs of central Kentucky? Well, uh, I am no geologist, but I I can tell you uh, the stories that I have been told over the years is that, you know, a glacier obviously cut Indiana so flat and that glacier ended here at the Ohio uh, River Basin. And we believe a lot of that uh, action of that glacier left a lot of these soft, um, soft limestone knobs. And a knob is basically just a rounded off. They all have a, a solid limestone cap but the uniqueness of it is the material in that knob is all the same type of rock there's no iron there's no any other kind of of, of rock that would normally be in a in a in a piece of ground that's been uplifted by the earth so we've always believed that these are just leftover debris fields from this glacier and uh, the water percolates up through almost every one of them like a big Brita filter so that's Part of the significance why a lot of us and before me uh, as distilleries were here was because of the water was so unique to Kentucky. I think only second to some places in Argentina, uh, you know, Cox's Creek over in Nelson County. And um, the, the water is, is obviously the, the main reason. Some of it came from probably a lot of those knobs. Now, as, as far as the map goes, we're not that far from Claremont. That's correct. We're not too far from Cox's Creek. Correct. Right. And uh, in Bardstown, it's just a, it's a little bit more than a stone's throw, but it is down that way. 20 miles, yeah. 20 miles. So, yeah, we're on the western side of the trail. That's correct. Okay. Are you the westernmost? Uh, not the most western distillery. Uh, I, I am, you know, I consider myself in the bluegrass region, but I am on the western trail. Uh, we've got three distilleries. You know, there's OZ Tyler. Uh, uh, there's, um, uh, you know, MB Roland. And, you know, and uh, Casey Jones Distillery out in the far west part of right. the Kentucky. Paducah, no, near Paducah, right? Yeah, Hopkinsville, Hopkinsville. that area yeah. there. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm only, I'm just, you know, the next exit past Jim Beam. So it, it's hard for me to think of myself as Western, but we are on the Western side of 65 if 65 is the dividing line. Okay. So can you take us through your, your process here at the distillery and, sure. and uh, how you do things here and why you, 
why you make the products that you make and what, how they stand out? Sure. Uh, you know, we are a pot stiller like a lot, uh, most of us craft distilleries. Uh, we have a two pot style series. It's just, uh, you know, a large strip still and an, a smaller finish still. That tends to be the norm throughout the country. I think that's pretty universal. Uh, you know, we bring our water from that tree we talked about. We haul that up here as we distill. Uh, you know, we try to use as much local grain. You know, for us, the grind of the grain is more important than the grain right now. Uh, so getting it ground, the, the, the proper, the proper uh, consistency is important to get good conversions. Uh, the water and, you know, we, we, we distill, we try to go into the barrel around, you know, 115, 118, somewhere around there. I think that's important to keep things, um, um, uh, you know, we, we don't want to, we, we don't want to push that 120. We, we feel we get a little better whiskey at that time. Um, you know, what makes us different? You know, I, I think uh, because we can only produce a certain amount of barrels a week that uh, we, every one of those become very, very important to us. And we want to make sure each one has the best in it that can be. So are you still producing roughly at the same scale you were when you started up here? Uh, well, we had a downtime for about a year. It took a year for us to get our license changed from where we started in the county to here. And so I, I think we're probably producing more now than yeah. what we did then. Uh, we hope to... Uh, it, increase the size of our still next quarter uh, and hopefully next year have a larger, uh, probably a three times larger strip still than what we have. So take us back in time a little bit. You no, know, you, you got this little gentle nudge from your boy said, let's start a distillery dad. Can you sort of tell, tell us about what that process is like and, and you know, what kind of pitfalls do you run into? How hard is that for somebody to do? Well, the process going through the government is, is, as it, it's, uh, I don't want to say that it was hard. It was harder when I started seven years ago than it is now. Um, in those days, there there were not a lot of craft distilleries uh, as opposed to what there is now. So we were still uh, uh, doing things even with paper. I mean, we were sending applications in with paper. So now everything's done via the Internet. But in those days, it was paper applications. Um, it, it took uh, over a year to get a license. I mean, that was just waiting and waiting and waiting and hope you did everything correctly. And um, they were always very easy to deal with. Uh, so that process w went well. Uh, we were lucky that we had a piece of a property that was already zoned um, to be able to do this. And I think probably most people, that's the, the downfall is getting the property that's zoned commercial that allows for our industrial use or for the product to be made. You can produce alcohol in a dry county. You just can't sell it to the public in a dry county. So we were the only distillery in Kentucky um, that was in a dry county when we started. So I think there's some now that are in a dry county, but we were the first. And and then along halfway along that way, we moved up to the city limits of Ratcliffe to be able to be on the Bourbon Trail. Yeah, so this is a this is a really nice facility you're in here. Yeah. So this wasn't your first. This is not where we started. No, we started in an old garage and uh, uh, very close to where that tree was, the water is. So uh, yeah, we've 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 kind of upgraded. We're up we, on the hill now. We're up on a hill now. Yeah. yeah. Now we're now we're backed up to a pretty famous military installation. Yeah. You got ties to that to that to the military. Uh, my my father did serve in Korea. Uh, I personally was not in the military. Uh, I, I, you know, we do some military projects. Obviously, we did the the Black Horse, the 1901. That was for the 11th ACR, the cavalry, and we're now doing a bottle for the 3rd ID Infantry. And, of course, our famous one of all is George Patton, which uh, has been a very, very big seller for us. Uh, so, you know, uh, I, I feel very connected to the military here. Growing up next to Fort Knox, you, you can't be here without having some kind of uh, sentimental attachment to it, for sure. I got a little bit of gold here too, right? Yeah, a little bit of gold. I heard something. I'm not sure where. <laughs> I think it's inside that bottle right I, I there. I think so. I agree. I agree. <laughs> so what's a what's a day like for a master distiller here at uh, Boundary Oak? Oh Lord, uh, you know, <laughs> I've never been asked that one before. Um, you know, you, you you have to get up and uh, you get up early, and you know, you wouldn't do this business if you didn't just love it. I mean, I. Yeah. I was thinking about it today. Uh, you know, so many people have to go to work who just who do not like what they do. But uh, I so enjoy coming here every day and getting ready to run it. And I love to have the peaceful time where I can, you know, turn the still on and and get things percolating and, and are cooking the corn. You know, there's a certain smell that you get. And um, uh, 
it's it's just just a marvelous job to have. Uh, I, I do have the best job in the world, I believe. So how do you, how do you, how did you prepare for that? How did you, I mean, does your background support being a master distiller? Did you? No, no. I, I think uh, what helped me so very, very much is, was all of our connections in the, the other distilleries. Um, all of my family worked in all the major distilleries. Um, my grandmother worked at one for almost 40, 40 plus years. Wow. Um, and so all of them had all of the, uh, um, the knowledge and the connections that I use. So when I did start, I was, I was able to have a lot of help uh, to be able to, to make sure that we made the best product that we could. And, and, and I, I owe it all to them. I mean, uh, it's um, they were there every single step of the way when I first started. Yeah. So what was it like uh, tasting that first white dog off the stove? Oh my God. It was, I, you know, when you don't know if it's any good, you know, you think, oh my yeah. God, is this the way it's supposed to taste, you know? <laughs> and uh, I, I wish I could tell you who did help me, but he was, uh, uh, you know, was a, um, a, one of the head engineers of one of the very large distilleries for many, many years, 30 plus years, you know, he'd made a, probably a good 20% or 30% of all the whiskey made in America. And so huh. he was just amazing to me. And, uh, you know, it, his help was instrumental. I mean, I, I owe it all to him, the, the, how they showed me. And, and That's good. So you had a mentor. You had somebody that was side absolutely. by side with you. Absolutely. And you yeah. almost have to. Yeah, because yeah, I guess, you know, I've heard it said many times. We've done a number of these interviews, but I've heard it said many times. If it's not com com good coming off the still, a barrel's not going to fix it. That's exactly right. And it's, uh, you know, simple things like, you know, filling the still with the right proper hose that, you know, you, you can't distill out the taste of plastic. You know, we can distill out a lot of things, but plastics you can. And um, just simple little things that you would not know where the off flavors come from. But, you know, years and years of experience from someone who will save you just so much time. Sure. It takes a while to master that craft. Oh, my God. It just it just takes forever. And, and God knows it took me a long time of messing a lot of stuff up before I felt very, very comfortable with it. But then you do it after a while, you, you get a little better at it. So if I ask you now what your daily drinker is, I think I know what the answer is. But if yeah. we go back pre-Boundary Oak, what did you like to drink? You know, I think I'm like a lot of uh, people in America. We love uh, Woodford, you know, Woodford Reserve was, I think, a gateway drug for a lot of us. Uh, you know, you know, God bless Chris Morris. You know, they just were brilliant there when with that. I, I think that was uh, probably some of the first uh, really good uh, whiskeys that, you know, I remember. And, of course, you know, you, you can't beat good old uh, Jim Beam down the road. You know, that everything right. they make is just, you know... Um, and of course, Blanton's, you know, those things sure. and Weller, all those things are just wonderful, wonderful. Alcohol. We like everybody's juice. Right? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, we like them all, you know, and, and I'm just, I'm just envious of all of them, but I'm also so proud of them in the same time. Is that what you, is that was like your first thing as Jim Beam when you were like a teenager or in college? You know, you know if you asked anybody about me uh, when I was young, the first thing they would tell you is Brent never drank anything. So I really wow. was not a drinker. I, I just, just didn't partake of it for the longest, longest time until I got into my 40s. And then I, I just started to find, you know, a really uh, uh, interest in anything Kentucky. And, um, and, and you know, and bourbon really is just liquid Kentucky. I mean, it's a representation of the spring, summers and falls that barrels had to go through. So it really is just a bottle of history. And, and I, I can see why people are just, you know, levitate towards it. Now you got some other products here, right? Too that you make. Sure, absolutely. Uh, you know, we uh, we are producing a new Kentucky brand vodka that's coming out that'll be just available in Kentucky. Uh, we have my old Kentucky home, which will be out here soon. It's uh, it starts out with a, a where we've got two barrels of twelve year old. Obviously, we did not distill that, but these two barrels were just wonderful gifts to me, and so we, we're going to put those into those very first uh, so many barrels of my old Kentucky home. Um, We've got our George S. Patton, George Patton, which is a, a, not really a bourbon. It's what George drank, so you can't call him on it. it is it is what it is, and that's what he likes. Now, is it a straight whiskey? It, it's not. It's just, it's a craft style whiskey. It falls into, it's a true devil's cut alcohol. And okay. if you go back and you look what real devil's cut alcohol was during prohibition, that's exactly what this is. And so we mimicked that way to try to get it as close to what he drank during the 1940s as we could find. And working with the family, I think they were our, uh, uh, you know, our, our, our best and worst critics uh, with the final product. 
Okay, so we've got the the Kentucky Amber, which Kentucky was Amber, Kentucky, so, and we so. have, of course our, our our original was Boundary Oak, was our first barrel of bourbon that hold the very first record for the most valuable bottle in history. Um, and then well, uh, let's we, talk about that for a minute. Sure. I don't want to skip right over that. Most valuable bottle. What did it sell for? Uh, so the very first bottle of Boundary Oak sold for $25,000 that went to charity. And then on to the first bottle of Abraham Lincoln, which sold just this, this last uh, February, uh, sold for 25550 So Lincoln's now the most valuable bottle of any kind of alcohol ever sold in America. Wow. So, so yeah, that's right. That's that's that liquid gold right there. That's liquid, <laughs> liquid gold. gold. Yeah. Now, this it, was all charity money. This was all charity money. Right. This all went to the Lincoln Museum and um, was bought by an Abraham Lincoln descendant. So, wow. Uh, yeah. That's amazing. Okay. So- we were talking about your other whiskey. Yeah, other whiskey, sure. Yeah. We've got our Kentucky Amber, uh, which is just a limited release. And uh, and then, you know, probably our uh, one of our most celebrated, the most known is our uh, Sinful, which is a cinnamon liqueur that has uh, that won best cinnamon liqueur in the world and, and out in San Francisco last December. Well, it's quite an accomplishment. I, yeah, I didn't even know I was even in that one. So that was a real surprise. But, uh, now, Sinful is spelled C-I-N-N-F-U-L, right? That's correct. Sinful. That's correct. And uh, it's a cinnamon liqueur that we worked on almost two years. Uh, our liqueurs, um, I mean, we really, really work on them uh, because it, almost inevitably everything you mix to an alcohol will taste like cough syrup if you don't watch it. To be able to find the right combination of flavors and natural or, 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 or not natural is, is, a, is hard to do. And so cinnamon was something that we worked and worked and worked on. Uh, we ended up with a real Madagascar cinnamon in it and it made all the difference. And uh, that's one of the ones you really just have to taste to believe. It's just remarkable. Wow. Well, we're coming up on the break here, so we're going to continue sipping on our Lincoln here. Uh, and when we come back, you'll have something else for us to try. I will. All right. Sounds good. We would like to thank Tommy and Gwen Mitchell from Logheads Home Center for supporting this episode of The Bourbon Road. Logheads Home Center, nestled in the hills of Kentucky, is an industry leader in building handcrafted rustic furniture. Family owned and operated, they take pride in offering only the very best for their customers. The Logheads, and that's what they like to call themselves, are skilled wood crafters who are passionate about creating rustic furniture for people who appreciate the beauty of natural wood. Owners Tommy and Gwen don't just sell the rustic lifestyle, they live it. And you can be sure that Logheads Furniture will always be handcrafted in Kentucky by artisans who embrace the simple way of life. Logheads Rustic Furniture is made from northern white cedar, a sustainable wood that's naturally rot and termite resistant. Its beauty and quality will add warmth to your earthy lifestyle for generations to come. Be sure to check out everything they have to offer at logheadshomecenter.com. And while you're at it, give Tommy and Gwen a shout on Facebook or Instagram at Logheads Home Center. Welcome back. We're here for our second pour segment with Brent here at uh, Boundary Oak Distillery. Brent, why don't you tell us about our second pour here? Sure. Uh, the second pour we have is, um, it's, it's we call it George Patton or Patton Armored Diesel. Uh, the reason it's called Armored Diesel is that's actually what George Patton called this. Uh, he, he named it all. Uh, he had a, even had a special bar that he made called Patton Armored Diesel, whenever they would go. Uh <clears throat> George, uh, of course, a lot of the American generals had a, had a real love for American whiskey. Um, uh, George had had a little too much of a love for American whiskey, and his throat was a little burnt up. Um, so he had he had gotten hold of some uh, Kentucky Devil's Cut alcohol. Now, for most of us in Kentucky, we realize what Devil's Cut alcohol, but for the rest of the world. Uh, Devil's Cut alcohol was which was very popular from about 1920 to about 1933, and what you would do is take a used whiskey barrel and distill some caned sugar alcohol, and you take a 53 gallon barrel or a 48 gallon barrel at the time, and you would put in five gallons in a large barrel. You would hold that in a, a warm area like an attic. 
And then in the summertime, you take it and you roll around in the yard until uh, after a certain amount of time, you would then take it out. Um, and and what you picked up was was the sweetness of the cane, but you've got this overwhelming flavor of oak. Now, for a lot of us in the distilling business, you know, the, once that barrel's done, we considered it done. Uh, but during that time, there was no alcohol being produced. And so this was all that they really had that had a wood taste. Uh, and so a lot of people really loved it. And it, and this is exactly what kind of alcohol George Patton drank. And when you drink it, you realize that there's no burn to it. You get all of the flavor of the wood without any burn. And that's because there's no corn in it. There's no corn oils that go down the back of your throat. Uh, so he was able to tolerate this and almost just really fell in love with it. So he, he served it at, uh, to all of his senior staff as they went across Europe. All right. Well, let's, let's try Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Cheers. It's got a very interesting nose on it. Now what's, what, what's the, I guess this doesn't really have an age, right? I mean, now, yeah, it's, it's, we push it around two years, a year and a half. I mean, we wait until it tells us it's ready to come out. Okay. Um, but it's not a specific time. No, it's, when it's, it's, ready. it's it's completely odd in the whiskey world. And so uh, it's not something that we would normally make here, but it it was exactly what he drank, as close to it as we could approximate. And we worked with the family, and the family would tell us, uh, you know, if it were close or not close. And um, and this is as close that we could come to it. And and then again, knowing the history of what he did love, and uh, we, we took a stab at it, and we think we did a pretty good job. So- so this is um, basically an extraction process using cane sugar white dog. That's exactly what it and is. So it's pulling some things out of the wood. I mean, tell you, it's definitely woody. Yeah. It, uh, it's pulling some things out of the wood that was left behind by the bourbon, right? That's exactly right. So it had, and I, I think the most unique character of it that, uh, Patton loved was it didn't have the burn in the back of his throat. Uh, so he could tolerate it. You, you get it all in the middle of your mouth and without having, you know, the, the normal burn that you get with a bourbon down the back. I don't, I, I didn't get no pepper out of that. That was, uh, yeah. Yeah. Nice and smooth. Smooth. It's, it's, they would call it almost a Kentucky scotch a lot of times when, when it was made in, in people's, you know, homes or, uh, I was kind of thinking of a Canadian whiskey. It very much is like kind a Canadian whiskey. It, it yeah. really is. But you're, you're not putting five five gallons in a barrel, right? You're putting, you're filling the barrels. Oh no, we, we put five gallons oh, in the five barrel. Gallons. Yeah, okay. we do it exactly the way it was. So we have a lot of barrels with a lot of five gallons in them. And um, if you put too much, you just get nothing. Okay. Uh, and so you really get all of that flavor of that barrel. And, and we try to bring it almost all out during the summer. I mean, that's when we try to bring the most of it out is it because that barrel's had time to seep and get hot and, and, and sweat and give you all of that flavor that was just left behind by the whiskey. And so, and, and also having the barrels that were fairly freshly dumped was important too. Um, and this is, this is not a, uh, an easy thing to do. This is a labor intensive process. This is not can't easy. It can't be a cheap thing it, to do. It cannot be cheap. It's not an easy thing to do. Uh, whiskey bourbon is much easier. Uh, this, you have to do it correctly and you have to, uh, um, you know, uh, you know, and, and some barrels are, uh, some barrels don't do very well. Some, most barrels do, but some of them don't. So you have to be able to, to, to be able to pick the best of the wood and, and we're able to get, uh, you know, barrels from some of our friends in the business that allows us to be able to, you know, extract some really good flavors. Let's go back for a second. And you, uh, you were talking about Patton and he, when he was out in the field, he was traveling around and stuff. Mm -hmm. There's seems like a pretty special story about his traveling bar uh, that, it relates to you guys. Yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, you know, the reason it's called Armored Diesel, uh, we did not name it. Um, George Patton named it Armored Diesel. Uh, from as close as we could realize, what he would do is, is he would uh, have this stuff shipped to him to Europe. And the barrels were, I guess, at some point being stolen. And uh, he was able to get a brand new uh, diesel fuel barrel. At that time, diesel fuel was pretty new. Most things ran on gas in those days. And he would slide a, I think at that time, a 48 gallon barrel inside of that diesel fuel barrel and then ship it to Europe. And so he would know what it was and his men would know what it was. He would write armored diesel on the side. So people still thought it was diesel fuel, but uh, it was such new they didn't really know what diesel was in those days. But uh, that way he could get his barrel of alcohol without it being confiscated or stolen or lost. Uh, any man that, that has a tank named after him should be able to call something armored diesel, right? Well, that's right. You know, it's, it's with this product, it really has no nationality as far as, you know, type of products doesn't fall in any category, but when you're the, you know, the liberator of Europe, you can drink whatever you want to drink. 
Has anyone ever mentioned like a like a hay note on this? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and a little bit of cedar, maybe. Absolutely, yeah. it, it does come across like that. It really does. Wow, it's it's very easy to drink. Very very, and that's and that's why I think he liked it so much. Another general with his with his whiskey, right? Like U.S. Grant. That's right. A general with his whiskey. You know, they, they like to say. Uh, no good meeting or, or no great piece of legislation was ever held over a glass of water. <laughs> <laughs> so can you tell us a little bit about, I mean, you mentioned it earlier, but can you give us a little more detail on your distilling equipment here and um, kind of what your setup is? Yeah, uh, we have uh, 850 gallon fermenters that are kind of short, fat and wide. Uh, we tend to like those. Um uh, our, we have two still process. They're uh, both pot stills. One's a one's a large 500 gallon strip still. The other is a four plate reflux still that is 125 gallons. They both complement each other just perfectly. Uh, you know, we strip out the alcohol uh, with the bigger still, and then we do the finishing in the little still. It allows us to fine tune it anywhere along that alcohol um, proof chain we want to because uh, it's final proof. Sometimes what dictates the product that you produce. Right. Uh, so this still does a very, very good job of, of controlling that. And, and both of them run, run together very, very well, uh, very efficiently. And uh, we're very, you know, very happy with it. But we do hope in uh, the, the next year to uh, replace the large strip still with a, with a large, um, uh, larger copper pot still, uh, you know, European style, uh, something that we can put up in the front of the building and all the glass to be seen. And uh, I just think not only it's a great visual thing for the distillery, but we love the whiskeys that come off of those large fluted, you know, uh, uh, Scottish style stills. Yeah. So you like you like the pot stills and what they produce. We do. We, we, we it fits us very well here as a family business. Uh, uh, I think it's something that we can manage and handle very well. And and I, and I I look forward to having one of those here. But you guys do some contract work. We do. We do a lot of contract bottling. Uh -huh. um, we do. Um, uh, we bottle for lots of people who like to put Kentucky on the bottle. I think that's fit us pretty well. I mean, we don't do a, a lot of it, but we've handled some pretty large profile clients. Um, it's always fun to work with those people. They're, the, the, the love that they have for Kentucky and the love that they have for Kentucky bourbon is always just... Uh, it's just it amazes me. My grandmother would have loved that, but uh, uh, yeah, we we have done some gins for some very high profile um, uh, rock bands. We've done um, uh, we're, we obviously we do some vodkas for ourselves. We do uh, some tequilas. Uh, we've got an aged tequila back there that's just remarkable, and we do a lot of rum. We've aged a lot of, and we've bottled a lot of rum here lately. Now, do you make an extra añejo, or we do? We have a, it's a, a pure agave. It's a, uh, and it's aged with peppers, cilantro, and ginger. We did it for some wonderful clients of ours here in Kentucky. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's 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 a remarkable tequila. You guys are very um, creative here. You got a lot of uh, special projects going on. Uh, it's you know I, I'm blessed to have boys who are really interested in what we do, and uh, I, I think uh, we try to, to pattern ourselves after the Heaven Hill model. You know, try to do as many different things as uh, they they do them all so so wonderfully, and we hope to 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 be as as successful and as uh, and as good as they have been over the years. Uh, but um, you know, it's it's fun to just see what we can do with other things, and, uh, and and it's 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 fun to be creative. That's for sure. And is there any uh, <clears throat> anything special that you got coming out? Oh, absolutely. We have two really uh, special ones. Of course, we have my old Kentucky home, which is a 12 year old whiskey. We only have two barrels of that. Uh, obviously, we didn't distill that particular product, but uh, uh, this has been gifted to me. Uh, and so we're going to put these two wonderful, wonderful barrels in the first adoration of my old Kentucky home, which is a, what will be a rye whiskey, but it's 12, 13 year old stuff. Uh, whether it's going to be cast strength, I don't know. I don't know how much juice is in the barrel. You know what? When they get that old we don't know how much is left in there um and then of course the other product is one that we're just really, really excited about that we'll probably also be just as known for is our uh our lavender bourbon uh lavender and bourbon was something i thought huh uh, what 
Man, I bet my wife she'll just she'll just drink that right. Yeah, up. it's just absolutely remarkable. It's uh, one of the biggest lavender farms in the state. It's in the next county to us, and so we were we're very lucky enough to have some wonderful conversations with them and and kind of do some experimentation. Uh, the last thing in the world I thought it would blend with was with bourbon, but when you have a drink of it, you, here on the Bourbon Trail, it's probably the most excited thing that we've had for people. There they're all just mesmerized with it. It's just really easy, and it's a wonderful thing to make a cocktail with. And when our, whenever our listeners want to go out and pick up some of your bourbon, what other states are you in besides Kentucky? Uh, our our biggest state is Texas. North Texas has been wonderful for us. Uh, we're now in uh, Missouri, uh, the St. Louis area. Uh, we hope to be in some of the, the larger grocery store chains there. Uh, Illinois, Southern Illinois, we've done very, we've been very successful, obviously with Lincoln, and of course Kentucky. Kentucky's been very good. We have now Disney distributing here that's done well for us. Uh, uh, Lippman Brothers in Tennessee, we sell. We also have uh, Georgia and North Carolina. So is it hard to keep product on the shelves? Is it hard for you to produce yeah, the, for the demand that's it, out there? It is. It is. It's It's been one of our biggest challenges. When you're a small guy and you only produce X amount, you have to, um, especially like a product like Lincoln, that's just so hard to keep up with. It has done so well, uh, you know, in Patton also. Um, Patton's a little easier, but Lincoln's been a little tough to keep up with. It's It's definitely one of the challenges that we have to deal with. So you guys are first and foremost a distiller. Correct. And you're making your own juice. But in addition to that, you are strategically sourcing some some liquids to make special releases and, and things like that. Absolutely. And some blending maybe? Sure, blending. You you have to. Uh, uh, when, when you start selling in multiple states and you're a craft distiller, you can only produce so much. And, and then when you get one that really starts to take off, you have to source it. And and the unique thing about Abraham Lincoln, we do source that particular one. The first ones we didn't, that right now we do, uh, is that we get to, because it is cast strength, we get to pick the best of the cast strengths. And I, I think in itself, it sh- showcases a, a lot of the whiskeys that you normally would not get to taste that, that were right out of the barrel. So uh, that's the exciting thing about Lincoln. Uh, and then for special releases, we hope to supplement it with our, you know, our pot stilled whiskeys when they come of age. Okay. Now, this is a true family operation. Your boys are helping you make some of this stuff up, every, right? Every single day, you know, uh, all th- three of my boys and also two, I have to, we call them two adopted sons that have been friends with my boys since they were in grade school. So uh, they uh, help keep me running every day and uh, they're all fine, fine boys. And uh, they're not boys, they're young men now, but to me, you know, they're always boys. But I'd, uh, I'd say that's the American dream right there. Yeah. You know, uh, I think sometimes I, I see it that way, but I don't know if they see it that way every day, but uh <laughs> Uh, but th- they do a very good job. So if if someone is uh, is running around the Bourbon Trail and they're they're at the Jim Beam Distillery, they're yeah. literally next exit up from you, right? Or that's, that's correct. Yeah. Just just down the road. Just down the road. And then you're about ten minutes off the Interstate 65, heading west. Heading west. <laughs> heading right. west. Um, what can a visitor expect on a distillery tour here? Oh, uh, you know, this this building is just remarkable. We're very blessed to have this big uh, 12,000 square foot building. Uh, it's laid out. It was designed for tourism. And I, I think uh, other than, you know, having a normal tasting like you would in any distillery, we're one of the very few distilleries, if not the only one that has a movie theater. So when you come in, you can partake of our seven minute movie that we have. And it's uh, all stadium theme. So that's uniquely different about us. And then... Uh, it's important that I feel it's important to me for as much as I possibly can to try to interact with every person who's taken the time to come here and, and show that they can have that little extra story to take back with them wherever they come from. You know, it's, uh, it's not that we think that we're all that important. It's just that it, it, everybody likes to have a story to tell. And, and if they can meet the guy who, who's working back there every day to make that bottle for them, then uh, it, I think it adds a little more, uh, a little more interest to them, to them and to anybody else they tell about it. So. Sure. Well, Brent, I got some friends. They came over here and saw you and they're, they're, uh, they're Coast Guard guys in the military and uh they they had nothing but great things to say about you they said that you really took care of them down here and uh you catered to them and it, it seemed like you to them it seemed like you really did care and that 
for a business owner, that's what you want your customers to see. Oh, it is. And, you know, the greatest thing you can ever do, and I, I try to tell the boys this, the, the greatest thing that you can ever do is is make a good memory for somebody. Uh, it's it's not about money. It's 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 uh, when they leave and, uh, you know, life is just a collection of memories. And we if we can be one of those really star moments to them, I, I don't think you could ask for any better job in the world. Do you guys also do like custom bottling? You mentioned that earlier. Yeah. Do you also do barrel selections? Absolutely, we do. Uh, and we're just, uh, and Illinois is wonderful. Uh, Illinois, sorry, is one of those states that loves to be able to depict. So we'll send samples to the distributor and allow them to be able to pick the, the barrel of Lincoln that they want. We do do that quite often with Lincoln. Lincoln's the only one we do that with now. Uh, yeah, because, you know, all of us who are, who drank whiskey and drank bourbon, we all know that every barrel is completely different Absolutely. than the next one, depending on where that barrel came from, um, you know, where that, uh, you know, how long it matured, uh, if it was near the outside wall, if it was up in the top, it was down the bottom. Um, it just determines, the, you know, the overall flavor of that. And so uh, we allow them to be able to come in and pick that flavor because it is cast strength. Mm -hmm. uh you know, there's a lot more for them there to taste. So, uh, something special you provided for us today is a third pour. Usually we only have two, but you, you gave us a little something special. Today. We're, we're here to please. That's right. <laughs> so, uh, it, you know, most people in this region, uh, know us for our cinnamon liqueur, which is called cinnamon, a uh, sinful spelled with a C. Uh, this was, uh, uh, highly, uh, uh, popular uh it's it's all handmade here at the distillery it is very it's a pain in the butt to make i'll tell you that right now uh but the results of it has just been remarkable it's 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 been very very popular here uh popular in texas you know very popular in tennessee and other parts of the country and uh and we use madagascar cinnamon when we make it and uh it's blended like i said 50 gallons at a time and uh you know uh, the boys take a really good um, pride in producing the best of this product that they can. And, uh, and we think it just showcases, um, you know, good craft spirits for sure. So you said this is award-winning. This is award-winning. That's right. This one uh, out in San Francisco, the, uh, the best cinnamon liqueur in class, if not the best in the world that was said. So, wow. Yeah. Congratulations. Well, thank you. Well, I'm glad we saved this for last. Yeah. That wouldn't have been much use to, to me drinking a bourbon. After oh, this. No. Yeah, you don't taste anything else but cinnamon <laughs> after you drink this. Yeah, it's it's really good to cook with. It's really good to, you know, one of the favorite things that most people do is take pineapple and pour this into a Ziploc bag with pineapple and let it sit overnight and then put it on their grill. Man, that uh, sounds good. It's just amazing. It is. It well, is. I can see why that's popular. Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Well, cheers. 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 Yeah, that is packed full of flavor, isn't it? Oh, it's... It's like big red chewing gum it's, to me. It's that's, like that's, big that's, red chewing gum. Oh, yeah. man. That, that could be dangerous. It, it is. And, um, you know, my oldest son, Miles, receives all the credit for this. He really um, worked on this and worked on this for many, many years when, um, you know, you know, all my boys kind of basically work on and off part time. Basically, they're in and out, in and out all the day. So. They say they work for free, which probably is true, but uh, 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 they're in school. So, you know, they, they're in uh, college. So uh, but uh, he worked on this when he was back home from Western and just really, really worked on it for the longest time and and uh, very critical of everything he does himself. And so uh, he just did an amazing job with it. He really did. Was he getting a chemistry degree or? No, no, he just uh, he, you know, all these uh, these these kids of mine, uh, you know, they're 21, 23 and 25, 20, uh, 25. You they're really not kids. You know, I call them kids, but uh, they uh, they don't drink. So they, they uh uh, I think they have a, a, a palate that's kind of very, um, you know, universal, so to speak. They're not, you know, like a wine drinker that's been drinking for many years and has, a, you know, a palate that's, you know, it's quite, you know, extensive. But uh, so I think it lends itself well to making drinks that just have this wonderful, uh, easy to drink, you know, almost candyish kind of flavor. Right. Well, Brent, we really appreciate you being on the show today. Yeah. But before we go, we'd like to give you an opportunity to let everybody know how to find you, how to find you on the trail, how to find you on the web, social media, and any, anything you'd like to shout out to 
to let people reach out to you. Sure. Uh, uh, and I have to think on this one because this isn't what, I, you know, we grew up in a time where there was not any sure. of this, but uh, BoundaryOakDistillery.com is our website. That's the big one. That's the big one, BoundaryOakDistillery.com. We are on the Kentucky Craft Bourbon Trail. So either one of those, if you if you Google that, you can find us on that. We're posted all over the internet. Now, I know you guys, I know you guys are on Instagram because that's how I reached out to you in the first sure. place. On Instagram, I think one of them is, is Sinful, at Sinful69, I think it is 69 proof. Uh, I, and also uh, Boundary Oak Distillery on Instagram too. So Great. Again, it's a pleasure to have you on here. I hope we can get back down again someday. No, you're always Especially welcome. when you get these new releases out. Sure, absolutely. You're always welcome. Right. We really appreciate it. appreciate all of our listeners and we'd like to thank you for taking time out of your day to hang out with us here on the bourbon road we hope you enjoyed today's show and if so we would appreciate if you'd subscribe and rate us a five star with a review on itunes make sure you follow us on facebook twitter and instagram at the bourbon road that way you'll be kept in the loop on all the bourbon road happenings you can also visit our website at the bourbonroad.com to read our blog listen to the show or reach out to us directly We always welcome comments or suggestions. And if you have an idea for a particular guest or topic, be sure to let us know. And again, thanks for hanging out with us. 